Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous few lectures, we've been looking at one-dimensional dynamical systems on the line. And in particular, what we focused really on is the types of solutions we can have. That is, we can only have steady state solutions. They can be attracting or repelling. We saw that there's some sort of in-between cases sometimes. Uh, but we also saw that we can't have oscillations, so nothing really all that interesting can happen. Now, really what we tried to focus on with those previous few videos is building up a geometric intuition, right? Trying to think of these things as maybe a particle flowing through space, as opposed to just some mathematical equation that says, you know, the solution of this differential equation is e to the rt, or something along those lines. Now, if you step back and really think about it, you know, although the, we built up this sort of inf, uh, intuition, qualitatively, not all that much interesting can happen in one dimension. Right? You can either be pulled into a steady state or pushed away from it, or go off to infinity. Not a whole lot. But what makes one-dimensional uh, dynamical systems so interesting is dependence on parameters. Now, parameters arise in all kinds of physical situations. They could be you know, some sort of external manipulation that you could be putting into the system. They could be growth rates of an animal species. They could be a friction, friction coefficient that's measured from data. There are all kinds of ways to include parameters. And what we're going to focus on in this lecture, and a few of the ones that are going to follow, is what happens when you start changing those parameters. In particular, we're going to look at bifurcations. Now, a bifurcation means a small parameter change leads to a large qualitative change in the dynamics of the system. And in this lecture, we're going to look at the, one of the most fundamental types of bifurcations, and that is the saddle node bifurcation. Now, the saddle node bifurcation is sort of like a big bang. It is uh, an example of where something is created out of nothing. Or you could look at it backwards, as we're going to see, and we're going to look at it as two things sort of collide and annihilate, sort of like an, a matter and an antimatter type particle here. Let me show you a sort of prototypical example of a saddle node bifurcation, okay? Just to get the intuition built up. Let's look at a one-dimensional dynamical system. And in this case, we have a parameter, which I'll call R, and we have a state variable X, okay? So it's, it's nonlinear. It has a de uh, dependence on a parameter here. And so what we're going to imagine is that we can change this value of r, right? Maybe it's an external parameter, something that we can tune to change the dynamics of the system. And so we can ask ourselves, what happens for various values of r? Well, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to go through the cases here, right? This is just a quadratic polynomial. The value of r just determines where you sit on the y-axis, where the, the sort of critical point of this quadratic actually lies. So let's look at case one. Case one is if r is negative, okay? So if we draw the x, x dot plane here, right? Remember how we, we learned how to do this for the geometry of uh, dynamical systems on the line? Well, in this case, our quadratic polynomial that defines the right-hand side has two intersections with the y-axis, it has two roots, and we've already seen that those roots correspond to steady states or fixed points or equilibria of the dynamical system. And in particular, we can draw some flow lines on this to get a nice phase line diagram. And what you can see here is that when r is less than zero, we get a stable fixed point and an unstable fixed point. Okay, so two fixed points corresponding to the roots of this polynomial. Again, you can very easily compute what they are. They're plus or minus negative r. And you get one of them is stable, one of them is unstable. Okay, so nothing that, you know, crazy or maybe even that interesting. Let's look at another case, okay? So that's like, that's half of the number line. You know, if you choose r as a negative value, you get this. Let's look at the sort of transition case. What about when r is equal to zero? So here, now, your critical point of your parabola sits right at zero now. So it's right here. And in this case, your flow lines indicate that you get a sort of semi-stable fixed point, okay? 
So in this case, you're sort of attracting from the left, you're repelling from the right. It's one of those in-between cases. You know, if, if you take, sorry, if you take r equal to zero in this case, your dynamical system just becomes x squared. And so, you know, the critical point or the fixed point is at zero. So if you linearize around this when r is equal to zero, you get zero. You get one of those sort of transitionary cases. Remember I said those are going to be interesting for bifurcations. Here's where they become interesting. All right, let's look at one more. Okay, so we've got two out of three cases covered. Let's look at this one. X, X dot. Now when R is positive, there is no intersection with the X axis here. And so there's no equilibria. Everybody is just always moving to the right. So let's imagine that we have the, the, the power to, to change the value of R, this parameter, right? It's an external thing. We can manipulate it. We can change it, okay? So let's, in particular, look at what happens when you drag R across zero. You start with two fixed points, and as you increase R towards zero, those two fixed points come together, and they collide when r is equal to zero. And if you keep going into positive r, they completely annihilate. Again, this is that sort of big bang uh, that's happening, or so maybe big bang in reverse, right? Particle, antiparticle, stable, unstable. They come together, they annihilate, they are completely gone. You can also look at this in reverse. You could say, well, there was nothing. And then as R goes to zero, there is a single spec. There is a, a semi-stable fixed point. And then as R goes into the negatives, that single point splits into two, right? The, again, this could be your sort of big bang scenario. You can imagine, you know, there's R universe and there's some sort of anti-universe that are sort of birthed out of this, this type of scenario. So in this case, we say that there's a bifurcation bifurcation at r equal to zero. And in this case, it's called a saddle node bifurcation, okay? So it's not the greatest name in the entire world. It comes from what happens in much higher dimensions and it comes sort of from a differential geometry perspective. So we're not gonna interrogate the name too much. You can just get used to calling it a saddle node bifurcation for now. But really, what I want you to see what happens here is you, if you and I are both studying this system and we estimate R differently, right? I estimate R to be negative, you know, something very, very small, 0.0001. I'm in this case. But if you estimate R to be 0.0001, something very, something positive, then you're in this case. Completely different phenomena. That's what the bifurcation is saying, right? You have qualitatively different dynamics taking place as you trace over the bifurcation point r equal to zero. And we can see this a little bit easier by doing the phase line diagrams that are associated with this. Okay, so I'm gonna put positive r at the top. So let's do this. So here we, can, we have our sort of uh, uninteresting positive r bifurcation diagrams. Maybe this is for a larger value of r and this is for a slightly smaller value of R. And then we get that one transition point where we get the semi-stable equilibrium. This is at R equal to zero. So again, all I'm doing is getting rid of the X dot axis here. And then what happens as R traces negative is this thing splits into two different equilibria, one of which is stable and one of which is unstable. And if I just draw one more here, draw a couple more, you know, as R gets more and more negative, these two things really start to split apart. Remember, we can get their exact solutions, right? It's plus or minus the square root of negative R. Now, this tells me a nice story, right? Something out of nothing. But what I would like to do is I'd like to draw, I'd like to represent this on a single graph, okay? So instead of having to draw five phase line diagrams, I would like to just track the fixed points because I don't really care about anything else, right? If I can tell you where the fixed points are 
and I can tell you which one is stable and unstable, then I kind of give you all of the information about the phase line diagram. Nothing else can happen, right? There's no oscillations, you know, nothing really exotic happens. So the only information that is valuable here really is where the fixed points are. So what I could do alternatively is I could draw a picture that looks like this. I could draw a continuum in the X R plane. And what I could do is I could draw where the location of these equilibria for every value of R. Now, again, this is just the negative square root of minus R. So that's this branch. So negative square root of minus R. And it is this branch, which I'm going to dot because it is unstable, okay? So if I give you a picture that looks like this, maybe I can, I can draw a few more pieces of information on here. I can show that you're flowing to the right at certain points. You're flowing to the left at certain points. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking that picture, all of these, and I just did it as a continuum. Instead of just doing five different values of R, I showed what it looks like for every value of R. This right here, is a much better way of representing a bifurcation than doing these phase lines, right? This tells me everything I need to know. I can see the flow directions given by the arrows. I can see that I have a stable fixed point given by the, the solid line. I have an unstable fixed point given by the dotted line. I can see that they separate as R becomes more negative. And in fact, there's a convention in uh, dynamical systems and in studying bifurcations that we typically represent not in the XR plane, but in the RX plane, okay? So let me show you what's called a bifurcation diagram. So where this comes from is the idea that you have the power to change R, okay? So, you know, typically we think of the horizontal axis as being the independent variable. Well, in our system, the independent variable is the parameter. That's the thing I get to manipulate, okay? So it's kind of weird to have the parameter on the, hor on the vertical axis. What we would prefer to have is the parameter on the vertical, or sorry, the horizontal axis. And so what you can do is you can look at this bifurcation diagram, which I'm about to fill in, and you can say, okay, well, I chose R to be somewhere around here. What did the dynamics look like? Or I chose R to be somewhere around here, right? So you get to pick where you are on the axis and then see what the dynamics look like. And what you get is these two branches, they flip. So you get an unstable branch of fixed points and a stable branch of fixed points. Solid line means stable, dashed line means unstable. This picture tells me everything I need to know about that dynamical system right there, okay? I need nothing else. Why? Well, each vertical slice of this thing is itself a uh, phase line diagram, right? If I know that something's stable, I know that I'm flowing into it. If it's unstable, I know I'm flowing away from it. So I don't even have to draw the flow lines on this. All I need to do is draw where the equilibria are. I see that for R positive, there's no equilibria because there's no lines. I see that the two equilibria collide at x and r equal to zero. That's what we call the bifurcation point, okay? So we would say that this is a saddle node bifurcation point, okay? Sn for saddle node. Now, something that's worth mentioning here is that the bifurcation theory is just rife with all kinds of conflicting and very, very annoying terminology. Okay, so sometimes saddle node bifurcations go by different names. Okay, so another name that you might see is a fold bifurcation. It comes from the fact that this curve is folding back on itself. Okay, uh, or similarly, a turning point bifurcation. And again, it comes from the idea that you're sort of riding along these curves and you're sort of turning around at some point. Uh, or a particularly strange name is the blue sky bifurcation. Now, this one is not used a whole lot. This
This actually goes back to a, a 1988 paper uh, by Abraham and Shaw. And the, the basic idea is that, you know, you sort of have something and it collides into nothing and then you just sort of float away. You have nothing to catch you anymore, okay? So originally you had this stable fixed point that would pull you in. Now, nothing catches you and you just sort of float away into the blue sky. Again, not the greatest name in the whole world, but just so that you're familiar, there's all kinds of different ways of saying this. Okay, let's look at another system where we see a saddle node bifurcation take place, right? So I gave you that really simple r plus x squared. You might think to yourself, okay, is that the only place where I can see a saddle node bifurcation? Absolutely not. Okay, let me give you another example here. Here's a fun one. Um, r minus x minus e to the minus x, okay? So again, a one-dimensional ordinary differential equation. It has a single parameter. I'm gonna keep using r as the parameter here uh, unless it comes from something physical. And this one is, is you know, it's completely nonlinear. It's more than just a quadratic polynomial. So the question is, um, you know, what happens here? What happens as I change r? And of course, you know, this is in the saddle node bifurcation lecture, so clearly a saddle node bifurcation will happen. The question is where, when, how, all right? So the first thing that we can do is we can start by looking for fixed points. Now, if you wanted to, you could use a, a software like Desmos or something like that, and you could just plot this for different values of r, right? You can make r something as sort of like a draggable parameter, and you ask yourself, how many roots can this thing have? But I want to be more clever, okay? Sometimes I don't have access to a computer. Sometimes, you know, maybe I'm stuck on an airplane. I like to do little exercises or something like that. And I want to just try and figure this out. I want to use my own knowledge of math to figure this out. X dot is equal to zero when Y equal to R minus X and Y is equal to E to the minus X intersect. That's kind of cool, right? So if I set this equal to zero and I pull this over, that means that I have two curves and I ask when they intersect. One of them depends on a parameter. It's a nice, simple line. And the other one is just e to the minus x. So I know what both of these functions look like. I don't need to do a whole lot of thinking here. So here we go. Here's my e to the minus x function. And I know that it hits one right here. All right, when x is zero, I hit one. And now, this is a super easy function to draw, right? The only thing that it is, is a line with negative slope. And the r value will determine where it intersects the y-axis, right? If I change r, I'm just raising and lowering it. So let's look at you know, a case where maybe r is relatively small. Maybe close, uh, let's do a negative r first, okay? Negative r is gonna give me something like this. So r minus x when r is less than zero. Okay, so again, I'm intersecting at r here. Now let's, let's imagine you know, dragging ourselves up. I could intersect maybe here as well. Again, still intersecting at r, but this is when r is between zero and one, right? Between zero and one. Then let's look at another case. If I go above one, I get r minus x, and this is for r bigger than one. But now I have an intersection of the functions, right? I had no intersection on these two. e to the minus x is always positive, right? It grows faster than a linear function. We don't have to worry about things that are off my picture. But now I get a two intersection points. So let's use that in intuition that we just built up. As r increases, I go from no intersections to two intersections. That sets off an alarm bell in my head. That says saddle no bifurcation. Something into, no, uh, sorry, nothing into something. Zero into two, right? So that's what it means to have a saddle node bifurcation. So the question is, when does it take place? Well, it takes place 
right here, right? When R is equal to one, okay? So my, my picture is getting a little bit crowded, but what I can see just from drawing, all right? I haven't done any real like calculus or anything, but I could say that a bifurcation takes place when R is equal to one, okay? So as R increases past one, I go from zero fixed points to two fixed points, right? Nothing into something. So then the question is, how do we do this analytically? Okay, so maybe this is, this is cute. This gives me some uh, intuition about what's happening, but what if I'm you know, not actually that good of a drawer? Maybe I'm just drawing the picture very poorly. Well, let's do some analysis, right? We can do some calculus here. Fixed points are going to occur at two conditions. One, r minus x is equal to e to the minus x. And two, r minus x and e to the minus x intersect tangentially. Okay, tangentially means that their tangents are equal. It means that the slope of their, uh, their they intersect at the same point and their derivative is equal. That is exactly this, right? The single little touch here that's happening, that's a tangential intersection. Up here, these intersections are called transverse because you move right through the curve. Here, you just touch it and keep going. So this gives me two conditions that I would like to solve. And in particular, this second condition means that the derivative of the first function is equal to the derivative of the second function, okay? So actually the second condition is much easier to solve, right? Because this gives me minus one, the derivative of this thing with respect to x. Remember, r doesn't depend on x, it's just a constant, right? I got to tune it, but it's still just a number. And this is equal to minus e to the minus x, which tells us that the intersection happens at x equal to zero. And then if I do r minus x at x equal to zero is equal to e to the minus x at x equal to zero, this gives me r is equal to one. Okay, so all I did here was I took my answer to the second equation, I put it into the first equation to find r. Two unknowns, r and x, two equations, intersection, tangentiality condition. And so this tells me that I actually have my bifurcation at r equal to one and it's happening at x equal to zero. So I gave you two systems that exhibit a saddle node bifurcation, right? You can draw another bifurcation diagram. It's going to look exactly the same, right? One uh, stable fixed point, one unstable fixed point. I'm going to leave that for you to have a little bit of fun with for now. But I want to show you something called normal forms, right? So that, that example that I just gave you of uh, r plus x squared turns out that that is prototypical of everything that happens with a saddle node bifurcation. And so you're wondering yourself, you know, how, right? What do you mean by that, Jason? You showed me that this system right here undergoes a saddle node bifurcation. You showed me that r plus x squared does, but what do they have in common? Well, our weapon of choice in this class is always gonna be the same thing, Taylor. We're always gonna do Taylor series expansions. Okay, so let's look at this. X dot is equal to R minus X minus E to the minus X. I'm gonna do a Taylor expansion of this thing about the bifurcation point. X equal to zero, R equal to one, okay? So I get R minus X minus one plus X minus X squared over two. And then I get more terms, right? So I, I'm gonna neglect the higher order terms similar to what we did with the stability of fixed points. And let's just start canceling things. Here I get r minus one, and then I get minus, uh, sorry, plus x squared over two. And then I'm going to use order notation to say there's, there's higher order terms, right? 
This means order x cubed. That means x cubed and higher are out there. But take a look at this. This is the same algebraic uh, form as x dot is equal to r plus x squared. It's basically the same thing, right? The only difference is I shifted r by 1 because the bifurcation now takes place at r equal to 1. And, you know, I, I have a, a 1 half in front of this thing. But we know that the 1 half doesn't do much, right? It just makes it shorter or fatter depending on if it's in there, right? But it's still a quadratic. It's still going to change how many fixed points you have as you drag across r equal to 1. So qualitatively, it's basically exactly the same thing that was happening here. And it turns out that this happens in general as well. In general, well, in general what happens is that if you have x dot equal to a function of x and a parameter r, and it has a saddle node, so Sn for saddle node bifurcation, uh, let's say at a point, x r equal to x star r star, okay? So in my case, x star would be 0, r star would be 1 for the previous example that I just looked at, okay? If we we're looking at that r plus x squared from the beginning of the video, this would just be 0, 0. But I'm assuming that it happens somewhere, right? And this is the point where you have exactly one fixed point. x star is the one fixed point. It happens at parameter value r star. Okay, let's do the same thing, right? The same little, you know, chunky Taylor expansion. Again, that's our weapon of choice. That's all we really have a lot of the time. Well, I've got my dynamical system, which I'm going to do a Taylor expansion about x star r, r star. So I get f of x star r star plus, and then I get x minus x star times the partial derivative of f with respect to x at x star r star. Okay, so the notation is going to get ugly here. Just bear with me. Plus r minus r star. And then the partial derivative of f with respect to r at x star r star. And then plus 1 half x minus x star squared partial derivative of f, the second partial derivative, sorry, evaluated at x star r star. And then I'm going to neglect all higher order terms, okay? So again, if you remember your Taylor series, this means I'm focusing myself very, very close to the bifurcation value r star and also very close to the bifurcation point x star, okay? So I'm really, really, really zooming in on things here. I'm neglecting quadratic terms in uh, r minus r star, and I'm uh, uh, neglecting cubic terms in x minus x star. Let's take a look at some pieces here, though, okay? So one, what is this equal to? So maybe... You know, maybe a good thing to do would be to pause the video for a second and try and figure out how to manipulate this a little bit. But I'm going to keep going with it. F of x star comma r star. Well, we said that x star is an equilibrium point at the value r star. So by definition, that means that this is equal to zero, right? That's the condition to have an equilibrium. The second condition here is that this term, the linear term, so partial f, partial x at x star, r star. I'm going to say that this is actually 0 as well. And this is actually called the tangency condition. OK? So there's no coincidence that I had two conditions over here to observe a saddle node bifurcation two conditions in the completely general case to observe a saddle node bifurcation. The first one was to get an equilibrium. Rearrange this thing and you'll see that it just becomes x dot equal to zero. The second one was to get a tangential intersection. Rearrange this thing 
and you'll see that it's just the derivative of the right hand side equal to zero. Those two conditions are actually encapsulated in this theory right here that gives me this Taylor expansion that looks a lot like what I just had right here. Because essentially what happens now with these two conditions, I get x dot is equal to some number, I'll just call it a, times r minus rc. So in my case, a was the partial derivative of f with respect to r, plus another number b times x minus x star squared, plus I'm going to put dot, dot, dot. But take a look at what happened, right? This drops out, this drops out. I basically get the same thing I saw up here, right? Uh, sorry, r star, not rc, pardon me. r star was equal to 1, so I get the r minus 1. In my case, x star was 0, so I could just get x squared. But look what happens. Through a Taylor expansion, everything just becomes that quadratic polynomial. And that means that by studying that, that quadratic polynomial that we started with, I can describe every saddle node bifurcation. Okay? They all sort of look the same. They all give the same bifurcation diagram, right? One stable, one unstable branch. It might just be focused around a slightly different point, but that's it. It's all the same thing. That's why we call it a normal form, because you can always just do a Taylor expansion to get that form, this sort of r plus x squared algebraic term. Now, one more piece. These two conditions provide a method for you to find saddle node bifurcations, right? There are two conditions that we applied here to do a little bit of analysis to find a saddle node bifurcation. You can do that for any system you want, right? You find an equilibrium value so that it's partial, that when you evaluate its partial derivative at zero, uh, sorry, at the, the critical point, you get zero. Essentially, that's where you can't conclude stability. Remember, I told you that was the important case for bifurcations a few videos ago when we talked about stability of steady states. So basically, in the case where you can't conclude stability, that means a bifurcation is taking place. Okay, when we come back in the next video, we're going to talk about another kind of bifurcation, a transcritical bifurcation. So I'll see you then.